So today we welcome uh, Barry Aikengreen from the uh, University of uh, California at Berkeley. These days uh, at the um, Graduate Institute, uh, we host the uh, uh, eighth conference of the European Historical Economic Society. And Barry is with us uh, for that conference and will be uh, delivering uh, on Saturday a lecture uh, on protectionism uh, in the 1930s. Uh, so Barry, uh, welcome. Um, you are uh, the most prominent economic historian uh, today involved in the international policy debate. Uh, could you let us know uh, what brought you to uh, the study of economic history? I think that's the, uh, the hardest question people ask me. Um, a non-calculating answer would be I had a couple of inspiring teachers. Um, Flora Gill at the University of California Jeffrey Parker, the Spanish economic historian at uh, the University of St. Andrews. But uh, a more systematic answer would be that I'd always been interested in history. Historians need a framework to, to use to make sense of history. So that might be Marxism, it might be postmodernism. For me, it turned out to be economics. Coming at it from the other direction, um, when I started to do economics, uh, the very mathematical um, version didn't re really appeal. So that led to a search uh, for a different way of, of doing economics, namely economic history. Uh, tell us now about your intellectual career and how economic history brought you to policy advice. Um, probably the policy makers. So um, when I uh, began uh, doing the sort of ec economic history I do, 20th century economic history, the history of uh, financial markets and the international monetary system, not very many people did that. So there were conferences and uh, journals like Economic Policy that came to me and said, would you write a paper, for example, on past experience with monetary unions to inform the current debate over European monetary unification. And I think it was those kind of invitations that came from colleagues rather than policymakers that kind of brought me to the attention of the policy world. And then one thing led to another. I, I would just add that I think there's um, considerable, considerable appreciation and an appetite for economic history in the, in the policy world and the financial world. They want to know about the real world and they appreciate the importance of history. Uh, these days, uh, as part of the uh, subprime crisis, uh, many journalists and observers uh, draw parallels with the uh, Great Depression, the interwar crisis. Do you think that these parallels are warranted? I do think the parallels are relevant. Uh, earlier this week, as we sit here, there was an op-ed in the Wall Street Journal by the historian of the Fed Alan Meltzer, that disputed this point and said comparisons with the Great Depression are overdrawn and exaggerated. I think the comparisons uh, are on point in the sense that uh, we were very close to the kind of financial meltdown that occurred after 1929 in the fall of 2008. Uh, the contraction of industrial production and trade globally was as rapid and severe in the year starting in April of 2008 as it was in the year starting in August of 1929. So we have pulled out of that nosedive because of uh, policy interventions. But I think uh, during those key periods, the comparisons were entirely appropriate. Have we learned uh, from history and from economic history well, we've, we've learned some lessons uh, from history. I think uh, the Fed and other central banks responded in the ways uh, they did because they learned the lesson that uh, inaction on the part of central banks was part of what made the Great Depression great. I would add to that, though, that history also constrains and limits the policy response. So a couple of examples of that would be um, initially in the fall of 2007, the Fed neglected the problems in the so-called shadow banking system 
because there had been no shadow banking system in 1929. Then the problem was concentrated in, in, in the center of the formal banking system. We failed to appreciate the importance of derivatives and credit default swaps around the time of Lehman Brothers and the AIG failure because there had been no analog to that in 1929. So history shapes the policy response both for the better and the worse. Overall, therefore, are you optimistic or rather pessimistic regarding the international economy? If you're asking about uh, the business cycle, um, I'm still on the pessimistic side because I think we've inherited a lot of debt and banking problems that will take a long time to resolve. If you ask me, am I, if, if the question is about the longer term evolution of the international economy, I'm more optimistic because I think China and India will be constructive, dynamic uh, forces. We kind of face the Kindleberger problem that the incumbent powers will have to make room for the rising powers. And I'm hopeful that we will uh, accommodate their, their demands for voice and influence. If you could only influence one major policy decision, what would that be? Well, um, I, I think the priority now ought to be meaningful financial reform, and I worry that uh, the appetite for reform has passed and that the window of, of opportunity is closing. So I would like to uh, have um, our policymakers take your course on the history of, of uh, financial systems to, uh, to be reminded that the crisis problem is still with us and that they need to uh, take serious concerted steps to strengthen and update uh, supervision and regulation. Thank you.